Um, I uh, am a uh, member of the Christians in the Workplace Networking Group Steering Committee, and I led the organization of this event, so I'll uh, get us started and, and introduce Mike. Um, you, you know, we have to do the standard. If there's an emergency, the exits are on either side where Mike is and, and then this side, and then we would just meet on the north side of the parking lot. So hopefully that won't happen and we won't have to worry about that. Um, I wanted to uh, just give you uh, 30 seconds on what uh, CWNG is. We're just a, a group uh, that's sponsored by Sandia, part of the Diversity Council, and our charter is to help Christians in uh, uh, many ways at Sandia. And so one of the things we were excited to be able to do is talk about finances. Um, there is uh, a lot of ministry going on in churches to help people with their finances. Um, I think that's because the churches maybe got tired of helping their people when they got in dire financial straits. So, but, uh, so that was part of our uh, reason for wanting to do this. So let me move on, though, and introduce Mike Cosgrove. He, uh, Mike is a uh, retired Air Force Chief Master Sergeant. When he retired in 96, he went into personal financial planning uh, to help folks out. He uh, did that for several years, and over the last five years has moved into uh, uh, the, a mission, a ministry, to uh, help people understand how to do their finances. And he is today sponsored uh, by a S Samaritan Counseling Center, and because of their support, he's able to come do this and, and give us this free seminar. So, Mike, without anything else, I'll let you uh, take the mic. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate that. Well, I know that you're all on your lunch hour today. It's a little bit of a finite amount of time. I'll try to take good advantage of that. You know, when I was a financial planner, I worked with a lot of people that were millionaires. I worked with a lot of people that were white-collar and blue-collar people. I worked with folks that were struggling day-to-day, month-to-month. Because don't you find out that no matter how much we make, we have the ability to spend it all. It's just a natural thing for us, no matter how much we make and how much we have. And I wish I could stand in front of you today and say that my wife Karen and I have made such great financial decisions our whole life, and everything's been just joy, joy. But i got to tell you, we've made some mistakes. And uh, part of that goes into what we're doing here to be able to help people. I wanted to tell you today that I'm going to teach you something that meets two very important criteria. What I'm going to teach you today is going to be very simple. And what I'm going to teach you is going to be very effective. I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of families throughout our community, throughout New Mexico, and there is yet to find somebody that can't take this information and make it work. Now, you're going to get the Reader's Digest version today because I've only got about 45 minutes. We're going to open some things up for questions. So we're going to move kind of fast today. So bear with me as we go forward. I wanted to welcome you because I know that your time is valuable today, and I appreciate your time. A couple things real quick that I want to cover for you. If you have your cell phone on right now, would you please just take a moment, turn it to stun or turn it off so we don't disturb people around us? That would be so helpful for us to do that. Uh, secondly, if you have any questions, what I'd like you to do is just make note of those, and at the end of the session today, I will stay here until every single one of your questions is answered. So at the end, we're going to have some microphones and stuff to be able to do that. Please don't be shy, because believe me, if you have a question, there's 10 other people that probably have the same question in the group. You have some handouts in a high-quality blue folder, don't you? I want you to open that thing up. Look on the left-hand side. You've got some blank notebook paper. Jot down questions that you have. Take some notes as we go through here today. On the right-hand side, you have got a series of handouts that I'm providing to you. We are going to move through those very rapidly today. I gave you two copies of most of them because I want you to be able to take this home, make a thousand copies, start working with it today uh, to help yourself financially to make it work. That's why it's there. Let me tell you a little bit about why I'm here. I am here because my wife and I want to help other people. We want to help people not have to struggle financially as most people are doing. Can we agree that the economy is kind of tough today? How many of you know somebody who's been downsized or they're in jeopardy of losing their home? They're struggling out there. Maybe some of you are struggling as well. My wife Karen and I do this as missionary work to be able to just come out and help you. So that's why we're here today. First thing I want to do is I want to show you a video clip on how many of us operate. I 
just can't get these numbers to add up. Oh, it's like we're never going to get out of this hole. Credit card debt. Will it ever end? Maybe I can help. We sure could use it. We've tried debt consolidation companies. We've even taken out loans to help make payments. You're not the only ones. Do you realize that millions of Americans live with debt that they can't afford? Which is why I've developed this unique program for managing your debt. It's called Don't Buy Stuff You Can't Afford. Hey, <laughs> let me see that. If you don't have any money, you should not buy anything. Wow, that sounds interesting. Sounds confusing. I don't know, honey. It kind of makes sense. There's a whole section in here on how to buy expensive things with money you save. Give me that. Where do you get this saved money? I tell you where and how in Chapter 3. Okay, but what if I want to buy something, but I don't have any money? Then you don't buy it. Wow. Okay, but what if I don't have the money to buy something? Should I buy it anyway? No. No, I'm really confused. It is a little confusing at the start. Okay, what if I have the money? Can I buy something? Yes! Oh, take the money away, same story? No. Huh? You shouldn't buy the stuff if you don't have the money. I think I got it. I buy something I want and then hope I can pay for it, right? No, you make sure you have the money, then you buy the stuff. <laughs> He's smart. It's all right. <laughs> you know, we say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, don't we? We look at this, but the reality is a lot of us make those kind of mistakes, and we don't understand how to get out of that. And what I call that is the debt cycle. And many of us are caught up in this. We get caught into this debt cycle, and we have to break that to be able to get a handle on the resources that we have. See if you can't identify where you are in this. This is usually how we enter the debt cycle. The first thing that happens is we usually want more things, and that's because of advertising. People all around us, if they have a product or they have a business, their job is to separate you from your money. When we want more things, we end up spending more, excuse me, excuse me, we end up spending more money. When we spend more money, emergencies come up, and we have surprise expenses, but the problem is because we spent our money, we don't have any savings available. When there's no savings, where do most people go when they want something? Credit cards. That's the first place that we go to. Boy, that's a gift that'll keep on giving, isn't it? You buy something, you're going to get those bills for the next year. So what a lot of Americans do is this. We work more hours. We take on extra work. When we do that, we find that we're overcommitted. How many of you feel overcommitted in your lives right now? Too much going on. Man, it's a big thing, isn't it? When we get overcommitted, we find out that there's not enough time to do the things that we find are important. Spending time with your children, grandchildren, being able to travel, do those things. Before you know it, time goes by, you continue to work and spend, and you find yourself getting depressed. You see, folks, because we're caught up in this debt cycle, and we can't seem to get out of that, we continually live in this world where debt continues to accumulate, and we always say, next year, I'm going to stop this cycle, and I'm going to fix it. You have that opportunity now to be able to do that. Where to start? It begins with a spending plan. Now, I'm going to say spending plan because that is a gentle way to use the B word. What is that? Budget. Man, don't you hate that? Don't you hate that? Oh, man, I've got to live on a budget. I must be a horrible finance person. I don't know what I'm doing. I've got to go on a budget. Let me tell you something about a budget, my friends. A budget makes people cringe, but it is the critical element in the journey to financial success. It is critical. Second thing is this, it is not complicated. It is simple to put one together, and I'll tell you what, it'll free you up. You will love it if you get on one. And here's what it does. A spending plan removes the emotion from a purchase because you know the reality of how much you can spend on something. Do we make emotional purchases at times in our lives? Man, let me tell you, that's a beautiful sweater. I got to have it. I like that motorcycle, I like that car. We buy emotionally in most of, the most of our lives. How many of you know who Warren Buffett is? Does he have a few dollars to rub together? I wish he was here, I'd ask him for a few of those, that would be helpful. Warren Buffett said this, and you wouldn't expect this to come out of his mouth, but let me share this with you. The fundamental truth regarding financial success 
and most people pay little attention to it, is the absolute necessity to live on a budget. Your ability to accumulate wealth depends on it. Now, would you think that Warren Buffett would need a budget? But he does. Here's step one. If you look in your folder, on the first, the first handout that I have for you shows five steps that we're going to cover today. It's kind of our outline today on where we're going. The first step is this. I want you to start thinking in terms of categories. Right now, most of us operate this way. You get a paycheck from your job. You have it directly deposited into your account. You spend from that checkbook. If the money runs out at the end of the month, it's not a good thing. If there's still money left, it's a good thing. But we don't think in terms of categories. And that's what I'm going to teach you right now. Let's talk a little bit about this. The second handout that you have is called the Financial Snapshot Worksheet. Please take one of those out. You notice that I gave you two. One of those, of course, is to make copies of later. Here's what this financial snapshot represents. First of all, it collects monthly data. What I want you to start thinking of is this. How much am I spending in a given category on a monthly basis? The second thing this does is it identifies those 14 specific categories for you. If you look at the form, you'll notice the number one, it is giving. Number two is going to be taxes. Number three is going to be housing. You see those? I want you to start thinking in terms of how much am I spending in each of these categories. It provides subcategories. Look at item number three. It shows you the housing category. You look below that, you have things like insurance, utilities, those types of things. So I'm going to take your mental mindset right now and stop you thinking in terms of how much money do I have in the checkbook to how much money do I want to spend in a given category and make conscious decisions about that. You can adjust these categories as you need to for your personal situation. For example, if you do not have children, you would not need that particular category to work with. So here's the form. Please uh, just look up here. I'm going to recreate it up here for you. You don't need to focus on what you have there, but let's just walk through this a little bit. The first thing towards your financial success is to determine how much money is coming into the household in detail. That may come from these resources, your salary, child support if that's coming in, maybe you have self-employment, retirement check, whatever's coming in. Every penny that you have coming in, you need to know how much that is in detail. Most people don't know that. Then the next thing you do is you look at your category expenses. Where is the money going? How many of you have ever had this happen? In your wallet or your purse, you have 10 bucks in there in the morning. You get home at night and it's gone and you don't know where it went. Ever happened to anybody? Man, we need to know where our money is going so we can determine whether or not that's where we want it to be. So the first category is going to be the giving. Do you give to your churches, your charities? What things do you give to? We take that out first. The second thing is how much is Uncle Sam going to get? Do we have to give him a little slice of the pie? Man, I wish we could adjust that. We'd all be a lot better off financially, wouldn't we? But we've got to give Uncle Sam a piece of that. Next one is the housing category. Please understand this. The housing category is not just the mortgage. It is the mortgage. It is the cable TV, the internet, the utilities you have in your house. Everything that encompasses what you spend to live in your home would go in this category. Then you have the food category. This is for items that you buy to fill your pantry at home. It is not food that you pick up on your way home from work at Burger King. These are things to be able to get from the commissary, John Brooks, etc. Automotive category. Think in monthly terms. How much a month are you paying for the payment or the lease? How much does it cost you for fuel, for insurance, for repairs and maintenance? Now, if you're thinking monthly, here's the thing to do. When it comes to things like repairs and maintenance, ask yourself, how much in a year do I spend? Do I get four oil changes? I got to get an emissions check. The car's going to need new tires. Think annually. Divide that by 12 and come up with an estimate of how much you're going to need for that year. And you'll have cash to be able to pay for the repairs you need. Wouldn't that be nice? Next category. We have insurances. You have your life insurance, your medical insurance your dental insurance and other items. 
that you have to cover and protect your family and yourself. Then we have debts. If you're going to be like Karen and I, when we first started this program about six years ago, we had to get a supplemental change, a supplemental form. We had debt. We had a lot of debt, and we had to work our way through. But what I want you to do is look at your debt and find out exactly how much you have and list it on here. How much are the monthly payments? That's what you're going to put in here. So you're going to have credit cards. You're going to have student loans, maybe some personal loans, payday loans, et cetera, et cetera. Even loans to mom and dad, brothers and sisters, personal loans can be on here too. But you need to look very hard at how much debt you actually have. Then you have entertainment. Oh, boy. This can be a biggie. When Karen and I started working on this program, we discovered that we were spending about $280 a month on entertainment, primarily dining out. We're both professionals. We were both working. And it was a whole lot easier to swing into a restaurant or go to a restaurant on the way home and be able to pick something up than it was to go home and cook something. $280 was a whole lot of money for us at the time. Now we do $50, right? 50 bucks a month for entertainment. Next category is clothing. Clothing is a very important category. You know, sometimes I counsel families, they come in and meet with me, and they sit down and I'll say, okay, how much do you spend a month on the clothing category? And they'll say, Mike, we just don't buy clothes. But they're dressed every time they're sitting in front of me. So they're spending money on clothing. You see, every category will have something in it. Every category. Then you move on to your emergency savings area. This is the short-term savings, the money in the bank or in the credit union. It is designed for emergencies. This is not your 401k program, as an example. Then we have the medical expenses, medical and dental co-pays, prescriptions. Maybe you have a child that's going to need braces coming up. Maybe you're an old geezer like me and you got hearing aids, you need to plan for something like that. But what is coming up medical that you need to prepare for? Miscellaneous. This is another danger area. You know, figure out how much you're spending in this in miscellaneous. So don't fall directly into another category. One of those is gifts. How much did you spend last Christmas? Throughout the year, how much do you spend on your children's birthdays, your, husband, your spouse's birthday, your anniversaries, mom and dad's anniversaries and birthdays? You need to know how much you're going to spend next year and stick within that parameter. So you can look at things like gifts, newspapers, magazines. I put manicure and pedicure on there because Karen does that. And I haven't gotten one of those in a while, but we're okay. Beauty, barbershop, all these different items. What falls into this category that doesn't fall into everything else? And then you've got your long-term investments, the money that you have that is going out of your paycheck or you're doing separate that is in preparation for you to retire someday. And if you have children, do children cost money? Yeah. I, I used to recommend just getting rid of those. No, I don't. You don't want to do that. But children do cost money. You've got to make sure that you have things taken care of for them. And we need to know how much you're spending in those categories. You get down to the bottom of this. You know how much your monthly income is. And you know how much your expenses is. You do the math. Then you figure out how much money you have left or you don't have left. And you make decisions. Guys, this isn't rocket science. But you've got to start somewhere. And this is where you start. I love cartoons, and here's one that Frank and Ernest said. I don't know if you're familiar with these guys, but it says this. I've been working on my budget, Ernie, and here it is. Line one is my fixed expenses. Line two is my fixed income, and the difference is the fix I'm in. <laughs> you know, you may be exactly the same way. You may get down at the end of this budget scrub, this budget worksheet, and you might find that you need to make some changes if you're going to get to where you want to go. That's what it's for. Step number two is to determine your existing budget. Believe it or not, you all have an existing budget right now. You're living by it. The problem is this. For most of us, our budget is spending everything in the checkbook. We don't know where we've been putting money. But if you think in categories, you can go back and you can say, look, this is how much I have been spending in food and in clothing and in housing. You can look back and find that. And here's how you do that. The first thing that you do is I want you to go to your computer or go to your bank and get copies of the last 60 days of your credit card and debit card reports. It will tell you where your money is going. So you look back over the last 60 days. Then to fill in the blanks, the second thing you do is you go to your checkbook and you look back in your ledger over the last 60 days. Where did your money go? And you put that information into categories. 
And the third thing that you do is you begin tracking your expenditures. All right, please hear this. If I had a soapbox, I'd be standing on it right now, okay? Guys, when you get done with this meeting today, let's say that you took an extra hour instead of going back to work today, which I highly encourage everybody to do. Take an extra, no, don't do that. All right, if you go right now and you head out and you go and grab something to eat at McDonald's on the base, when you get done with that, get that receipt. When you get that receipt, what category would that go into? Entertainment, all right? That's an entertainment category because it's dining out, all right? That would fall in there. If you do that every day and you track where your money's going, you put it in categories, you will not overspend in a given category. That's where we start. Is it going to be easy to do? No, because you're learning a new skill. But it works 100% of the time. Step number three is you determine your projected budget. We know where we've been. We just talked about the money that we're spending. We just did that. We found out what our existing budget was, right? Now we have to determine where we want to go. And here's what it's all about. What are your goals? What are your dreams? What's important to you? You see, my friends, the income that you make, the money that you have, if you can handle it and you can focus it, you can accomplish the things in this life that you want. But if you don't, you're going to be like so many people that come into my office and they're 65, 70, 75 years old, and they say, you know, Mike, by the time I was this age, I thought I'd be here. But we didn't follow the plan and we're over here. Doing a budget is something that'll help you get to your goals. So here's the tough part. How many of you are married? I'm going to ask you to do something you've never done before. I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to go home tonight, get with your spouse, and I want you to sit across the chair from each other. And I want you to look each other in the eye. Is that tough? Oh, man, you're married. I don't know. Looking at each other in the face here, I don't know. You look at each other, and I want you to hold hands. And I want you to say, sweetie pie, I love you. I want to do things with you we get in the future. I want to be able to retire. But you see, you need to establish your goals together. Because what you're going to be able to do now that you're going to be establishing a budget, you're going to know where you're going. You're going to be focused on it, and you're going to be doing it together. It's critically important that you do this. Then I want you to complete a budget analysis worksheet. It's in your folder. You've got two copies. Don't worry about it right now. It's up here on the screen. Let me share it with you. Here's what's going on. This budget analysis worksheet is where you start building a budget, a spending plan. Take control of your expenses. Here's where we're at. Notice that we have the 14 categories right here that are on your financial snapshot worksheet. You all have one in place. Now, you determined your existing budget by looking back the last 60 days at your credit report and at your checkbook. Now, you sit down with your spouse, or if you're single, an accountability partner, or a girlfriend or boyfriend, and you say, look, this is where I want to be. This is where the budget's going to be, the projected one right here. So you determine where your spending is. In this case, this example, they're spending $950 a month in the housing category and $325 on food. You make a decision that, you know what? I think we can spend a little bit less on the housing category, and I think we ought to put a little bit more money into food because the kids are getting really skinny. So you can make adjustments. You make that decision. What do you want to do? How do you want that to work? And here's where it gets tough. All you got to do is get out your calculator, and you subtract the projected from the existing budget, and you put that figure right over here, the difference. Right now, you're spending $15 more in housing than you want to. Here, you're spending $25 less than you want to. And you make that choice, and then you enter that resource over here, and you create that budget based on the new figures that you have. My friends, that's as complicated as it gets. That's as complicated as it gets. So here's what you do next. You develop your budget. When you're determining what that figure is going to be in your budget, you've got some tough things you've got to do. First thing you've got to do is you've got to determine the difference between a need and a want. In general, a need is food, clothing, and shelter. And in my case, sometimes motorcycle stuff. But we won't count that. But also the wants, what are those? What can you determine is going to be important to you? Remember, it's all about your goals and your dreams and where you want to be. Second thing is this. If you need to find money to help you achieve the goals that you want, you have some choices. You can decrease your spending. 
You can increase your income or you can sell things to get out of debt. Karen and I did the uh, selling things. We had all this stuff. I was a financial planner making good money, spending every penny of it. And Karen and I decided we're going to get out of this debt, and we started selling stuff that we had. I tell people all the time, we had an estate sale, and I wasn't even dead yet. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to get rid of the stuff, don't you? So guys, those are the options you have when you're figuring out your budget. The fourth step is to create a spending plan. That's the fourth step. You need to put that together. We just talked a little bit about categories. That's part of all this and how it works. Let me share this with you. First thing I want to do is I want to point something out. Some of you are sitting there right now, I guarantee it, and you're saying, I have a budget. And you have Quicken as an example. And at the end of the year, you go through your year, and you're very diligent about putting in those numbers. And at the end of the year, it prints you out a beautiful pie chart. And it says you spent this much on food, this much on entertainment, this much to charities. And you look at that, and you say, I'm on a budget. No, you're not. Accounting is what you are doing, and an accounting tells you where your money has been. That's what those kind of forms and software does. It tells you where your money's been. I don't care where your money's been. That's history. A budget, when you're budgeting, it tells you money where to go. I want to achieve this in my life. I want to send my kids to college. I want to take a trip to Hawaii. I want to pay for Mike and Karen to go to Hawaii. I want, okay, maybe not that. Whatever your goals might be, guys, you see there's a difference between accounting and budgeting. Budgeting is where you're going to tell your money where to go. It's an important distinction that I want you to remember. It can be electronic or it can be manual. I don't care. Karen and I do our budget in a three-ring binder. This is, whoops, and I dropped it, which is a bad thing. Hold on. We do our budget in a three-ring binder. That's all. Something simple. You know what? We're in a technological age right now. You can go on a computer, and you can do whatever you want to do. We do ours in a three-room binder. We have it written down exactly what we want to make happen. It works great. If you want to put it on a computer, that's great. Simple and effective. Keep it simple. Let me show you how to set this up, OK? Here's what you do. Your binder set up, the first thing you do, and I've given you a handout of a form that has some information on it. It says, uh, the, uh, let me just click on this. It includes the date that something is due. It has to be paid. This happens to be mine and Karen's. This is exactly the same thing. I took the amounts out of there for obvious reasons, but the information is the same. I want you to sit down and type this out or write it out. I don't care. Write it out and find out what is coming in on the first payday and what needs to be paid, where the money's going, and how much money you want to spend in each category. You want to include all that debt on there. Guys, this is going to take you some time. It's going to take a few minutes to sit down and figure out exactly when something has to come out of a paycheck. Have you ever had this happen? Have you ever had something that is an annual expense come in? Well, let's use insurance for your car. Usually paid every six months, or you can pay it monthly, but let's say that you did it on an annual basis. Have you ever had a bill come in, and you go, man, I forgot, and you don't have the money available to pay that? If you have this kind of a little, little note to keep you straight, you'll never forget about those bills again. It'll be there for you. How does it get paid? That's another thing you want to put in. So how does it get paid? Some things Karen and I pay with using what's called a cash envelope. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Some things we pay by automatic debit. Some things we write a check for. How do you pay it? You see, you want to keep track. You want to know where your money's going. First thing you do is this. If you're going to do a manual system, which let me tell you, I recommend it for the first six months because it is simple to look at the numbers. And if you're married, you'll do it together. If you do this on a computer to start with, one person will go up and do it on the computer and come back and tell their spouse, this is what I did. And that's not what good communication is about, right? You want to work together. So you purchase some dividers. We have 14 of them in our binder up there. And we label them by the 14 categories that are on the financial snapshot worksheet. Giving, taxes, food, whatever. And you list them. And then you just put in a category page for each category and what you want to spend. And I've given you those, but you'll see it right here. This is a category ledger. It is just like a checkbook ledger, guys. We're just breaking it down. So let's say, for example, that this is the ledger for the food category and how much you want to spend. So all you do with that form, make a bunch of copies, label them, and you say, all right, this is going to be for food. On the first payday, you decide that you want to have $150 out of that check to buy food. 
The second payday, you want another $150, so we're spending $300 a month on food. And I ask you to think annually, so that means that you're spending $3,600 a year on food. I want you to be aware of what you're spending annually because it can surprise you. So, as simple as this. This is as tough as it gets, guys. July, we get paid, and in July 1st, we make a deposit of $150 into our account. We've got it. We go shopping. We hit the commissary. We spend $135. I subtract that figure. I have $15 left. Then I get paid again. I deposit $150 on my ledger, and that's how much I'm putting in. And then I go shopping again. I spend $127, and I have $38 left at the end of the month. You leave that $38 in there for the next month. Roll it over. Because it will continue to build. Because what happens to your food bill at Christmas and Easter? You're prepping for that. You're getting ready, all right? Because you're going to have all the kids home, and they're going to eat you out of house and home. You better be ready. And you just continue to do that, guys. This category ledger page simply takes the information on what you want to spend in each category and captures it for you so you never overspend. Now, let me tell you this. If you do get in a situation where you run out of money in a category, you have to make adjustments. Let's talk about that. Here's a budget analysis worksheet like you have, but let's look at the auto category. What's happening to the price of gas right now? Man, I love that I paid 370 or excuse me, 272 one time. Man, I was I wanted to high five the guy taking the money. I thought this is great. Now we're back up to, you know, what 85, 95, 92, whatever it is. If something changes in the economy, you have to be able to change with it. So let's say the price of gas goes back up. And you've committed $450 a month for both of you and the family to buy fuel that month. The price of gas goes up and you run out of money. Where do you go to be able to pay for that gas need that you have? Where do you go? Anybody? Perfect. You go to another category. If you just said credit cards, I said, no, 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 no. But we tend to do that. We tend to go to another category so, or go to credit cards. But let's say this. Let's say that, okay, you make a conscious decision that you're going to take the money out of clothing. So we look up here and we say, all right, clothing, we have it booked at $135 a month. Sweetie pie, let's go ahead and lower that down and put that money up here so that we have enough to cover the, ga the gas. So you subtract that, lower that to $110, take that $25 and roll it up, and now you have $475 to take care of the automobile category the fuel category in that area. You see, guys, once you know the numbers, once you have a handle on what's going on, these decisions become easy. But you've got to start. You've got to start. Use a cash organizer for problem areas. Man, I'll tell you what. This is old school. How many of you have heard of a cash envelope system before? Man, you know, I mean, it's something that people have done for years, but we get so caught up in the technology that we use the credit card. So Karen and I have a problem with spending money on entertainment. And it's all her fault. It's, sorry, baby. Okay, maybe not. But you see, what we do for entertainment is we decide we're going to spend $50 a month on that as an example. We take $50 in cash out, we stick it in an envelope, and we put it in a tab here. I bought this at Staples for $3.90. We have a tab in here for entertainment. We put that money in there. At the beginning of the month, we put our money inside there, and Karen says, Honey, listen, I want to go out and get a dinner, and I want to go see a movie. And I go and I get the envelope, and I open it up, and there's 50 bucks, and she says, baby, let's go. We're going to have a great time. So we pack up, we go out there, we come back. I get the receipt, uh, get the receipt. I put it back in the envelope, and then we live the rest of the month on whatever we want to do. But at the end of the month, Karen comes to me, and it's the 28th, and Karen says, listen, I want to go out and see dinner and a movie. I said, oh, man, that'd be fun. Let me go get the cash envelope. So I take it out, and I've got $4.38 in there. Whew, dust. Not a lot. We have a decision to make. We can either say, honey, listen, let's go to McDonald's. We'll get a cheeseburger, cut it in half, get two glasses of water. We're in. <laughs> or I can say, let's wait till next month when we put the money in. What we don't do is say, let's put it on the credit card, and we'll pay it off next month. Because we don't pay it off next month. This is valuable. It works 100% of the time. If you have a problem area, use a cash organizer. Don't do this. Kathy says, I'd like to order that 14 karat gold trim leather bound receipt organizer so I get my finances under better control. No! 
Don't do that, guys. It'll get you in trouble all the time, all right? Stay within your means. Be cautious about what you're spending. The bottom line is this, guys. A budget is a very simple thing, but it takes your effort and your time to put it in place. And it's not the easiest thing in the world to do unless you get started. You've got to take that first step. Step five, eliminate your debt. Now, I know none of you are here today because you have debt. I know that. You couldn't possibly be living the way that Karen and I were earlier, where we were just buying stuff and we'll pay it off later. Did you? My grandfather used to tell me this. If you find yourself standing in a hole, stop digging. You ever heard that before? You see, guys, a lot of us are standing in a debt hole right now. But we keep digging because we don't have a plan. And you've got to have a plan to do the things you want to do. Let's talk about it. I'm going to teach you something that's called the Debt Snowball Worksheet. You have two copies of a Debt Snowball in your folder for you to use later. This is the most efficient way to retire your debt. And it works wonderfully. I wish I could stand in front of you and say, Mike Cosgrove invented this. Yeah, I wrote it. I got a trademark. Nobody else can use it. People have been doing this for 100 years, all right? It's a debt snowball. Let me tell you how it works because it will work for you. Here's what a debt snowball looks like. First of all, let's look on the left-hand side of the page here. Look at these debts. Texaco, Sears, Visa, MasterCard, Discover Card. Are those unusual debts in today's world? No. In fact, most people will have at least some of these type of debts that will be there. So the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to write down and list all of your debts in the left-hand column. That's the first thing I need you to do. What we're going to do then is we're going to list them by the lowest payoff, from lowest to highest. That's the next step. Lowest payoff to highest payoff. Then you pay the maximum uh, that you can on the lowest account, the lowest amount. In this case, the Texaco bill is 190 bucks. So let's say that you have a garage sale, you pull the cushions off the couch, wherever you can find money, and you put as much money as you can onto that particular bill, because we're going to slap it. And then we're going to make minimum payments to everything else on this chart. You're going to put as much money as you can in the top one, minimize the rest. This amount of money that you are paying in your debts presently, right now, whatever amount that is, including your mortgage, it will stay the same until every single debt, including your house, is paid off. So in this case, in this example, we're talking about $1,700. So here's what you do. The first month, you put as much as you can on this. And let's say that you got the Texaco bill paid off right away. Great. You've got it done. You take the money that you were putting on that particular bill, and you roll it to the next bill. Snowball it. Move it down to the next bill. You don't take that money and go, hey, baby, let's put that in entertainment. you got to stay focused on this, all right? So now I've got the Sears bill. I roll that money from here down into here. I pay the additional payee. This amount stays the same. We don't put the money in our pocket. And after a couple months, in this case, I got two bills paid off. We roll the money, take both of the payments from here, and roll it into here on the Visa card. We get that one paid off, and we're at four months. We've got these three things done. Yours may take longer, or it may be quicker. I don't know. This is just an example. But now some of you are sitting there saying, yeah, but Mike, the interest rate on one of these is higher. Shouldn't I go to the interest rate first? I know you're thinking that. But let me tell you what's happening here. I want to get you a sum in the win column. If you can pay off the things that have a low amount and you get it paid off, you get to celebrate. You get to say, look, we got something done here. But if you elect to pay off something that's a $15,000 bill because it is a higher interest rate, you will become very discouraged and you will not continue. So I want you at the beginning to pay off the lowest first to get some wins. But now look at what's on the screen. Now we have got the MasterCard and Discover Card. MasterCard, we have $854 at 11%. Discover Card is $3408 at 20%. Which one do you want to pay off first? Yeah, maybe you want to skip this and pay this one off. You don't have to. You can pay it off any way that you want to, but because we're working at Sandia, I've got some engineers in this room. You guys are analyzing everything I'm saying. I know that. So I don't care which way you go, but you want to be sure that you stay focused on the goal, all right? So in this case, we're going to skip MasterCard. We're going to go to the Discover Card and pay that off first. We're at 17 months. Now we take that money and all the rest of it, and we roll it up here to the MasterCard. We pay that off. We're at 20 months. 
No more credit card debt. And by the way, if you're living on a spending plan, you'll never have credit card debt again. My wife and I, in almost five years, have never had a credit card bill because we have a plan. It's okay to have a credit card. You just need to manage it. So now we've got to pay off the rest of our consumer debt. So we come down here, we've got the furniture store, we pay off the furniture. Now I've got a choice to make. I've got a student loan at 6%, and I've got an auto loan at 11%. You make the choice. Let's say in this case, we roll this over, we pay off the car loan next, all right? So we get that paid off. We're at 42 months. We do not have a, a loan payment on our car. So since I paid that off, I should go down and trade it in for the Lexus that parallel parks itself, right? Yeah. No. Guys, you drive that car till the wheels rot. You drive it and keep it, all right? So we pay off the car. Now we go back up to the student loan. We hammer that, and we have no more debt, and we can start prepaying our mortgage. Did you know that when you have a mortgage, you can pay it off early? Most Americans don't. You want a half a million dollar house? Buy a $250,000 house and make every payment. You got a half a million dollar house. We want you to pay that home off as soon as you possibly can. So you roll all the numbers from here into your home, get it paid off as soon as you possibly can, all right? Now, we do that, we're at no more debt, you have completely debt free. In this case, it was about 10 years. I don't know how long it'll take you, but think about the possibility of being completely debt free and knowing what your goals and your dreams are and working towards that. It's not the way most Americans work, is it? Mostly we just work until we get so old that we get to retire and we can go work at Walmart or someplace like that. We don't want that for you, not at all. Guys, this works 100% of the time. So here's what the, the tips to be financially successful. I want you to remember these because this is real important. First thing you got to do, you got to have a plan. Guys, you got to have a plan. I want to know where you're going. You want to know where you're going. You want to know where every penny is headed. You want to control it so you can say, no, I don't want to spend my money here. I want to spend my money here or I want to put it away or whatever it might be. But you got to have a plan. If you don't have a plan, I know where your money's going. It goes to somebody with a plan. Okay? <laughs> that's where it's going. We got to stop that debt cycle. Remember, that's the key is to stop that. Here's the second thing. Be content with what you have. Folks, we have so much. We have so much. Most people in other parts of the world can't imagine what the home you're going home to, the car you have in this parking lot, but yet we're never content. Advertising tells us that we need the newest, the biggest, the brightest, the shiniest of everything. Be content with what you have. Be realistic about your needs and wants. Really, what's a need? What do you need? Do I need this right now or do I want it? Can I say yes or no to those things? And I want you to leave with something that I think is the most important thing that you're going to learn today. Now, everybody pay attention because this is critically important. I've studied. I'm a financial advisor. I've gone to colleges. I've studied things. I've done. I'm just a wizard when it comes to finance. And here's the most important thing you're going to learn. Just say no. Say it. No. Again. No. Guys, if you can do that, if you can say no to some of these things, you're going to start seeing your money accumulate and you're going to have it made. But you've got to have a plan. You've got to be able to be content with what you have. You've got to know what a need and a want is. And you've got to be able to say no to be successful. Now, when you do that, you become financially free. Financially free doesn't necessarily mean that you have a quarter of a billion dollars in the bank. But what it does mean is that you don't have any stress in your life. You can relax about finances. You can enjoy your life and make it happen. But my friends, I've had the, I only had one full hour, and I've got to be a good uh, manager of your time. The concepts that I've outlined here for you today are the concepts that my wife and I teach in our community. And if you really, truly want to be successful, you take the next step. And let's talk about that. Karen and I teach a course called the Living Debt Free Workshop. You're going to pick up a flyer on the way out. There's a flyer. It's six hours long. We even feed you. You've got to eat somewhere. You might as well eat with us. Come on down. We teach you the budget in detail. We also have the Money Academy that starts on February 6th. Let me tell you a little bit about that. 
The Money Academy is a six-week program that will teach you how to communicate with your spouse or your partner. It will teach you how to set goals because I give you homework. It will teach you everything about a budget. It will help you learn how to invest smartly. It's a holistic approach to finance. Karen and I teach that together. And we have a ball. Now, here's the thing about these courses. They are absolutely free. There is no hidden agenda. I don't have anything to sell you. Karen and I do this because it's something that's our calling, something that we enjoy doing very much. We have a great time poking fun at each other, and you'll find that it's a great thing to do. We encourage you, if you come to either one of these, to bring your spouse. But please understand, there is no charge for you to be there. When you pick up the thing on the way out here, you're going to have that flyer. There's going to be a website on there. You can sign up on the web, or you can call the number for Arlene that's on there at this number, 842-5300. But I know it's rare in today's days and age to have something that's no, no, somebody without a hidden agenda, and you're going, man, yeah, wait, when I get there, no, there's nothing like that whatsoever. So please don't be anxious about that, all right? Now, we're going to open up the floor for some questions. We have 10 more minutes before... I've committed to having you all out of here. Uh, but what I want you to do is this right now, just for just a moment. Let go of any apprehension you might have about questions, because there's other people thinking about this as well. So what I'd like to do is just open up the floor. If you guys have questions, please just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. Let's talk about this, because this is important. Go ahead. Right in the back back there. There we go, we've got to test it. My question is simply, do you have any workshops for singles? You know, everybody's welcome to these, singles or married. Uh, it, it just, the, the normal thing is we usually get more married than we do singles, but anybody can come to this at all. It's not just specifically designed for married couples, so great question. Uh, Jerry, you got one over here? Oh, we got one right here. Go ahead, sir. Hey, Mike. Um, when you're paying these off on the uh, debt, um, snowball worksheet. Yes. Would you recommend when you're starting to get down here to pay the in, the ones with the highest interest rate first? Yeah, or does yeah it you matter? can. And that again is up to you completely. Whichever one you want to do first, is, you're always welcome to do that. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Uh, if we manage to not quite spend it all, do you have any advice on uh, how to find a good investment advisor? Uh, yes, I, there's, there's a number of things you've got to look for in an investment advisor. The first thing that you have to remember is that you're hiring that particular individual, and it's got to be somebody that you can relate to very easily when it comes to an investment planner. But that person has to be in tune with wherever your goals are. Now, there's a number of folks that I work with that I would be happy to uh, provide you with some information about them. And just when we get done here today, just come on up and we'll chat. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Right Let me go. We've got a microphone over here. Let me come back over here. Okay. Go ahead. So, so the idea of getting rid of all your debt is really attractive, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on um, dealing with other objectives, right? I can't wait until I pay off my house to start saving for kids in college yeah. or to make improvements on my house, never mind basic maintenance, but to start improving it so I can sell it someday and things like sure, that. Sure. What are your thoughts on that? You know, you get, and it's a great question. Uh, it is not about, this isn't about getting out of debt. And everything that we teach is not about Okay, I'm out of debt, now I can do whatever I want to do. It's about your goals and your dreams. You have to always have what's next. So, yeah, we're going to pay off the debt, but you've got to always ask yourself this question, why? Why am I doing this? You all have a purpose on this earth. You all have goals. You all have dreams. Maybe you, like Karen and I, we wanted to be able to teach people this. That's something that we always wanted to do. We couldn't do it unless we were debt-free. So you've got to have that secondary goal, not just getting out of debt, but what do you want to focus on? Great question. Hi, Mike. Uh I had a question. Uh, in, a, in a situation where you're renting and don't have a mortgage, yeah. after you are debt free, do you, do you have any advice on should, I just, should you just save for, to buy the house in cash or uh, do you care about the rent that you're spending? Uh, do you have any advice on wonderful, that? Wonderful, wonderful question. Here's the thing about renting. There's, a, there's an article that I just read recently. It came out in the Wall Street Journal and it said, renting the new American dream. And I've got to tell you, there's a lot of things to be said on that. First of all, I used to get, when I did seminars, people would come up and they'd say, man, I'm throwing my money away if I'm renting. But you're not. You are living in a place that's providing you shelter, which is wonderful to do that. Many, many people are saying no to a house nowadays. If something goes wrong with your water heater in a place that you're renting, who pays for that? 
your landlord. The roof starts leaking, the landlord takes care of that. And you can save a significant amount of money doing that. So please don't think that it is a wrong thing to do in renting. But to answer the question, if you feel that you want to get a home at a certain point in time, you are going to have to save for that home during the time you're taking care of everything else that we're talking about here uh, to get a down payment and be able to make those things work. So it, it depends entirely on your goals, on the things that you want to do. Great question. Who's got the microphone? Go ahead. Yeah, on your financial snapshot worksheet, you had a debt place. Yes. And then when we went to the snowball, there was a specific amount that we had for the bottom. So is Correct. that just the sum of all your minimum payments? Yeah, the, what, we're, what we're using on the debt snowball is the sum of the minimum payments. Unless you have decided that you're going to commit an extra 20 or $30 forever to that debt for the remainder of that till it's paid off. So that's the way you do it. The one on the snapshot captures how much you're paying a month uh, to give us a ballpark figure of how much you have left to separate out at the end of that budget analysis. Okay, okay so if you're paying more than the minimum payment every month, you should... If you're making more than that and it's fit into the budget, I encourage you to continue that because we want to pay off as much debt as we can as quickly as we can. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, oh, pleasure. Uh, assuming you. we're able to respect our categorical budget parameters uh, as well as not carry a rolling balance, would you endorse using uh, credit cards to take advantage of their reward programs? Great question. A lot of us get caught up in that where you have, Karen and I have a credit card, and again, that's just a tool. And we use that because all three of our boys are serving in the military, and we like to be able to travel and see them. So we get frequent flyer miles. We use the credit card for budgeted allocations to make that happen so we don't get in trouble. If it's not in the budget, we simply don't buy that product. What happens a lot of times is that credit card companies will give you a rewards program in anticipation that you'll start charging things just for the rewards. That's how they get their money. Be very cautious with that uh, and how you use a credit card in that regard. So do the categories. Use the credit card if you choose to for only budgeted items within that uh, category system. Give him the microphone again, Jerry. Would you please? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. And then record that in, in the respective category, not absolutely. in Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything you buy will be written down in that specific category. Critical. Thank you for that. It's very important. Yes. Who's got a microphone? Right here. Okay, please. I'm, I'm, for the planning, I'm trying to find recommended amounts or percentages for um, home repairs, auto repairs, emergency savings. Yes. It is very difficult at first to be able to do that. That's why we look back at history. What have you been spending in those categories so that we can get a ballpark figure of what you're going to spend in the future? So you look at, you go back and you say, all right, last year or last 60 days or however much, this is what I spent on the car repairs to do that. That gives us a starting point. Now remember this, a spending plan is a living, breathing document. You are not going to be able to sit down and come up with these figures and say, hey, we're done. All we've got to do is just stay within this. We're good. It will change. Sometimes you're going to get a promotion or you're going to get a raise or you might have a decrease in cash flow and you need to adjust it. Prices go up on, on things that you buy. So this is something you've got to really pay attention to. So at first it's difficult, but we're going to teach you how to do that when you come to the class in detail. Emergency savings? Emergency savings, yeah. We're going to, you need to always put away something for emergency savings, even if it's only five bucks a month. But what you do is you look at the remainder of the budget and you say, okay, we need to put a certain amount of money away to break this debt cycle. We always recommend that the target for emergency savings to start with is $1,000. 90% of whatever comes up in your life will cost $1,000 or less. It breaks the debt cycle. Yes, sir. Uh, that was basically my question, too, was uh, between savings and 401K was a rule of thumb between the two, because 401, long-term planning, retirement, sure. and, and that was... It's a, based on a number of factors, but predominantly we recommend that you get up to, you, you start putting away about 5% of your income into a savings account, 10% into investments if you can, and allow that to continue to grow, uh, and then update as, you, as your goals change and where you're at changes, then increase or decrease in a given category to do that. But man, guys, I can't tell you how important savings is. We have the lowest savings rate, uh, second lowest savings rate right now in the world where, I'm sorry, in the uh, civilized world where you see people that are not saving. We only save 4.7, which is higher than what we used to be. Uh, in Japan, they're saving 14.3% of their money into savings right now, a lot. Sir. Mike, um, on your worksheet there, you, you have the 14 categories. Um, why don't you have a category to pay yourself first? 
because I've been through another uh, financial seminar, and they said the first thing you need to do is pay yourself and then look at your debts. And, and you really are. You've got to pay yourself first, and we have the two categories of investing and savings. But that's a great point. Guys, you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to pay yourself first. So when I'm looking at these 14 categories, at first we're looking at them all at the same time. But you decide what you want to take out and make happen first. It's based on what you want to do. Paying yourself first, phenomenal concept, and you should do that. You should get some money set aside. Otherwise, when you're 65, you won't be where you want to be. Yes? Yeah, um, I was wondering about school debt. So yeah. have about so I could make a higher payment, or I could put that towards a 401k. Yeah. Um, and I'm not fully, in, I'm not at 10% yet, so I could, I was wondering whether, yeah, how to weigh those it, against It's always other. a tough thing to balance. If you have, if you have debt and you're, you say, listen, I can, I can either pay this off quicker or I can go ahead and put this into my mutual fund things. Think about it this way. Historically, since 1929 when mutual funds first started, you are, if you did 7 or 8%, you had a great career, great run in doing that. And frequently our debt, not, usually not student loans, but other debt is going to be a higher interest rate than that. So if, you're, if your debt is 6%, retire that debt. You know, get rid of it so that's out of the way. But think about it this way. If you have an 18% debt, 18.9 on a Visa card, and you're saying, well, I'm going to invest my money, you're probably not getting 20% return on your money. You see what I'm saying? So don't pay out in debt more than you have the possibility of gaining in an investment. Guys, there's nothing that will put peace in your heart more than getting rid of debt. It, it really will. It'll just give you a a kick in the high knee to get moving a little bit, you know. So get rid of your debt first. I would recommend debt first, then increase your investments. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So this is a kind of a technical question. Okay. On the financial snapshot worksheet, you're showing gross monthly income. Right. And then uh, the second category uh, is taxes. So uh, does it really matter if you report here in, rather than gross monthly income, what your paycheck actually is, and well, then if you do that, what are the taxes that you're... You bet. It, it, it's a great question, and the reason that I have them separated out is this. If you just take your net pay, there's other things other than taxes that are already coming out of there. For example, your investments or your medical or other things along that line. So I wanted to draw a distinction so that we didn't accidentally just take the bottom line and put that in there, and then we double count something in another category. That's the reason for doing it that way. But certainly, if that works for you and you're conscious of separating out the investments or the insurance, that's perfectly all right. Okay, so Make then it I, easy. Another, I think I'm going to do it your way. Yes. Um, another question related to taxes. I usually get a, uh, a tax refund. You bet. So uh, is there, would that be, if, if I could anticipate it, would that be in the other income yeah, category. if you anticipate that's coming, remember, when you get money back from the government, a frequent mistake that people make is this. They say, okay, wow, free money, we're ready to go. But what you want to do when that money comes in and other income, and you know what that's going to be, you separate that into the categories that need to be shored up a little bit. Okay. You know, maybe you anticipate that you're going to be uh, putting new tires on the car, take some of that and put that over there. So that's exactly right. Okay, thanks, Mike. You betcha. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I was just listening to a radio program, and they were talking about um, deferred taxes. So the, uh, like a, 401, a traditional 401k that you put pre-tax money in right. and that versus like a Roth IRA that you would do post-tax. And Correct. their comment was that um, deferred tax is always better. And I, um, I was just wondering what your opinion was on that. That is, I think that that statement uh, is, is probably one that will make people make mistakes financially. There are some that are deferred taxes, and there are some that are tax-free. And I, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but let me tell you this. When you get up to, the, to your retirement age, you want to create two bags of money, one that is going to be tax-free and one that is going to be tax-deferred, because you may continue to work at an elderly age when you get a little bit older, and if you're still working, you don't want to be taking money out that's going to be at a higher tax bracket than you anticipated. So you want to create two bags of money. The statement may have been related to something else, but certainly... There are reasons for both types of investments, a, a deferred and a pre-tax. Yes. Okay. So, so you have this money left over that you were talking about in, when you're doing your budgets and you're underspending and some. And I'll give you an example, but oil changes. My truck sure. takes twice a year. Sure. Uh, registrations, 90 bucks a year, 180 right. every two years, whatever. Okay. Do you take the money, do you put your 
underspent money, so you, you budgeted for this in another place. Do you have another checking account that has this for the times that this pool goes into? Are you separating the saved money for the anticipated costs in the future? You can do that if you like, or if you keep track of it in the ledger. When, when Karen and I write it down, we already know that it, it's in the checkbook, but whatever's in that checkbook, we have $500 that, that is already earmarked for that particular purchase, whatever that might be. So you are doing that without the physical movement of the money to another account. Okay, so you have this ball of money in your checkbook. You go to the budget, and the budget tells you how much of that money in the checkbook is already accounted for for a given category. So whenever you make a purchase, you don't go to the checkbook to do it. You go to the budget, and you say, this is how much I'm allowed to spend in that category. I think that the logistics of having to open up a variety of different accounts would become tedious at best in order to do that. So just do the budget book. If you come to the class, we're going to show you very specifically how to do that. Yes. Do I have any other ones? Guys, I know that we're out of time. I appreciate the privilege of coming down and talking with you. If you come to the class, we'd love to have you there. Uh, but uh, if not, maybe Jeff will invite me back another time to come and do it here on campus. But thank you so much for having us today. I appreciate that.